earthly plate. An examination of exclusion, governance, and the sustainability of informal food retail in Kingston, Jamaica. A brief overview, but not a spoiler for the presentation. The presentation looks at food vendors, which comprise a significant component of the urban informal economy in Kingston, Jamaica, and occupy a critical space in urban culture and sociostate. Despite the visibility in these spheres, the vendors are often overlooked by policymakers and also in academic discourse. And thus they're placed in a precarious set of circumstances by regulatory frameworks, which often exacerbate already marginal circumstances. The work used a combination of questionnaire surveys, in-depth interviews and discursive analysis um, of media representations to present some insights into the challenges and resistance among the community of small scale food vendors operating in Kingston. Um, just quickly, some of the results point to um, road expansions, public health policies, spatial planning practices, um, among some of the things that contribute to their vulnerability. But you'll hear more about this from today's presenter, Dr. Robert Kinlock. Dr. Kinlock is a lecturer in the Department of Geography and Geology here at UE Mono. He serves as a chairman of SAJE Property Services and a director of SAJE Logistics Infrastructure Limited. He has a passion for real estate development and investment, which ideally complement his academic interests in urban planning and geographic information systems. His research interests center on sustainable urban development and include areas such as housing, food systems, informal governance, and climate change vulnerability and adaptation. We are very um, privileged to have, hear from Dr. Kinlock. He is the recipient of numerous awards for his research from the University of the West Indies. And in 2018, Dr. Kinlock was selected as a Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Scholar. Over the past decade, Dr. Kinlock has participated in numerous research projects and collaborative work with other universities. He has, in addition, served as consultant for organizations such as the World Bank and the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. For those of us joining today, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Kinlock to give his presentation. Robert, you're muted. I think he's oh, my to apologies. Me. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Thera. I was asking if you could go, if you could actually enable my screen share. Okay, great. Thank you. You should be able to share now, Robert. Yeah, I am. Thanks. Okay, so good afternoon, folks, and um, thank you for you know attending this seminar. I am going to talk to you today about some research that was done a few years ago um, in 2018. I have subsequently made some addition, some modification to it, um, con con collected some additional data. And I consider it to be um, somewhat of a work in progress. Now, I just to give you a little bit of background, um, the work is part of a, a larger body of work 
that is under the umbrella of the Hunger Cities Partnership. The Hunger Cities Partnership is a network of universities um, across um, the global South um, and Canada. Um, so, you know, most of these are Commonwealth universities and stuff. Um, and the partnership is focused on building the knowledge base um, and by extension influencing policy as it relates to food security and hunger and malnutrition and all, and all of these things, different dimensions of food security. Um, the partnership is essentially focused on um, urban food security, um, but does not necessarily neglect, neglect the intricate connections that exist between urban and rural spaces. So the University of the West Indies through Professor Hope, myself, um, Dr. Therese Ferguson, uh, Dr. Natasha Mortley. Um, we are the representatives of the Hunger Cities Partnership for the University of Western Indies. And we have, um, and yeah, so, and we've been working with this team since 2014, 2015. Um, in addition to that, uh, and they were the ones who really funded this research. The research has also been funded by Universities Canada, who provided a grant um, in 2018 under the Queen Elizabeth Scholars um, Foundation and IDRC and other organizations. So um, it has been extensively supportive and I'm just starting out by just giving thanks to the persons who have supported this research financially and in other ways. All right, that's what the, the partnership is about. So I'm gonna be talking to you up today about a group that I consider to be, um, as I have put on the slide, precariously placed. And this precarity is, um, is actually exacerbated to, in, in my view, um, by a lot of, you know, a lot of what has been happening in our planning and policy landscape. Um, now, I'm going to start out with just giving you a little bit of a geographical context um, and so some, some socioeconomic context as well. And we get into the, the, um, the theoretical base for this research, um, then the methods, and then um, the three themes that I've identified here, vulnerability and marginality, resistance and revolt, and information gaps represent really the core of the presentation. Um, and so to start, this research um, piqued my interest um, mainly because of the, you know, my own observations, my own interest in Kingston as it related in, in social development, my own interest in issues related to policies and, 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 and urban planning. And, and of course, you know, concerns over rising levels of inequality and marginalization. So that is what that is what really peaked, sparked my interest in this in this research. And of course, that's part of why I I was very happy when invited to participate in the Hunger Cities Partnership. Now, when we look at the city of Kingston, we it's 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 no surprise that you know we that you know our urban development is quite dense. It is increasing in density. Um, our rates, as as it relates to a national level, our rates of urbanization have kind of slowed down, however, particularly as it relates to the Kingston metropolitan area. However, when you look at the overall level of urbanization, it remains kind of moderate to high. And I'm considering it to be moderate because it's at 56.31% um, in the 2020 estimate, um, certainly when you compare it to other um, territory, some other territories and other countries, you know, it is, it is, you know, it, that would be considered somewhere around the mid range in terms of urbanization. But what we have is a circumstance where we have constantly been awkwardly navigating the impositions of urbanization. And that has essentially resulted in many of the classic symptoms of urban blight. 
And some of those symptoms are, dilap you know, what we see as we drive around the city, dilap dilapidated infrastructure, um, you know, poor maintenance of, of, of not just public, but private facilities as well. Um, you know, more vendors on the streets, um, more signs of, you know, of, of, of resistance. Um, so, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing all of that environmental degradation and all of these things could constitute um, the symptoms of urban blight that we're seeing in Kingston. But in addition to that, we also have really high levels of inequality. And much of that inequality has actually been exacerbated um, by circumstance, by, by, by the prevailing circumstances. Uh, when you think about the potential impact that COVID is going to have, has had and is going to continue to have for a little while um, and, you know, widening the gaps that exist, the social and economic gaps that exist in society, uh, we begin to visualize the ways in which what we're seeing in Kingston might actually be, might, might, might actually, you know, be, 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 be intensified. Um, we also have a circumstance where, you know, we have really rising poverty. It has, you know, we've always had rising poverty, but what's interesting is that amidst the rising poverty, our, our unemployment rate has actually trended down up to 2020. And of course we know what happened in 2020 with, with COVID and that is, you know, that is gonna, that, that has created a, that, that is probably gonna, or has created a spike in unemployment. Um, we saw, uh, we saw, and when I say trended down, we're, we're, I'm talking a specific reference period from about 2012 to present. So over the last years, it has actually been trending down. Um, so that's that's the negative side of what's happening in Kingston. But you know, there are positives. So as we drive around the city, we also see, um, you know, all of this, you know, urban blight juxtaposed, um, you know, symbols of hope. You know, we see a lot of urban infrastructural development. Um, and that reflects a lot of the capital injection that is taking place. We also see this one is 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 both positive and perverse. We also see, you know, more and more of the informal sector as people find alternative ways of navigating the impositions of structural and economic change. So, how can we situate? all of what's happening in, in, in a kind of theoretical framework. And this paper that I'm trying to put together situates it within the political economy framework, um, mainly because um, what we're seeing in Kingston really represents a lot of the intersections between you know, economy, society, and politics. Um, when, and, and particularly, it looks at the ways in which you know, these structural factors, these structural forces, these macro scale forces really influence what is happening at the micro level. Um, and one of the main conduits of, of, this, or of, of, of this economic change or this economic transformation has been around for several decades. It is this um, double-edged sword of neoliberalism. Um, and neoliberalism, has essentially contributed to rising levels of urban poverty, uh, but it has simultaneously also facilitated a great degree of wealth. So we have, through neoliberal processes, been able to um, invite and, and inject capital into our economy from different, you know, from in, from different um, investments, international and international investments in particular. Um, so we see we're seeing revenue flows that come into the economy as a result of um, this neoliberal agenda. However, um, that is in addition to, that, that is in opposition to what we've seen as, you know, rising inequality. So a part of the, one of the conduits of neoliberalism was structural adjustment that you probably would have um, heard about um, already. Um, the, in the 1970s, we were the first country to go to the IMF for, for a loan. And that loan came with certain conditionalities, and those conditionalities um, were really um, characterized by a lot of fiscal tightening and stuff like that. And so, what, and part of that fiscal tightening was, you know, 
the the government had to reduce the engage uh, the extent to which it participated in the public in in what well, well the support that it gave to public infrastructure, public services, public facilities. Um, there was increased privatization, um, wage freezes, and all of these things. And all of these things meant that, to a um, to a large extent, um, you know, the country had newly imposed constraints, and that thwarted growth, but while simultaneously helping. So we, we it's, so it's a really kind of complex picture of, of, of what of what has happened. Uh, but one of the results of that, as as you know, there is fiscal tightening, as you know, it what it has what it has resulted in was an increased engagement um, in the informal sector as people um, search for opportunities, employment opportunities, and as opportunities in the formal sector are limited, people transition into the informal sector as a potentially viable alternative for earning. And so what is happening at the macrostructural level or at the macro scale level influences what happens at the individual level. And then we see also where this, where, where it can even translate to, you know, the impact uh, not just on the individuals, but uh, by, by extension on the households in which these individuals live. And then of course it feeds back into these kind of cycles of poverty that we have observed. So what are my, given all of that, what, what, what am I interested in looking at? And um, the presentation today will focus on the following research questions. I really want to find out that uh, what are the main challenges faced by small scale food retailers in the city of Kingston? I also want to know how are these challenges com compounded by municipal plans and policies? and how retailers negotiate their circumstances of marginality. And then finally, I'm interested in understanding how the policies potentially address compromises in urban sustainability. Now, to do that, I adopted a mixed methods approach. Um, and it could be considered a sequential mixed methods approach where I started with quantitative work um, in the form of a questionnaire survey, and then I progressed to my qualitative work. Now, for the questionnaire survey, um, this survey was done on food retailers. Um, and but when I say food retailers, I'm, 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 I've included both operators and as well as supervisors, any representative of that food business, um, particularly informal food retailers. Um, informal small-scale food retailers. Um, we had a sample size of 877, and that was derived um, by going around the city of Kingston and actually attempting to do a census on the food vendors. So this is really a subset of the food vendors that is really controlled mainly, primarily by response rate. What we did, we separated Kingston into commercial arteries, commercial nodes and then communities. And then we went into each of these areas um, over a period of about four months, um, four or five months, and we interviewed people in these locations. Um, the respond respondents were, were really purposefully selected based on these locations and, and their mode of engagement um, in food, which was food enterprise. I think I probably didn't phrase this properly on the slide right so so it, it was we our criteria for inclusion was that it had to be a food vendor and it had to be a food vendor that operated um on a relatively small scale so we're thinking about employing less than 10 individuals now this had to be in accordance with um with the standards used in the other countries that was doing this research because we wanted to maintain the compar the comparative power of the research. So we wanted to be able to compare it to the experiences of you know what was happening in Mozambique and what was happening in um, Cape uh, with the vendors in Cape Town and, and other places. So we had to stick to a standardized survey instrument um, that was actually quite a lengthy survey instrument over 
I think uh, about 500 questions. It took us on each vendor it, no less than an hour and a half to two hours to administer each of the surveys. So you can imagine it was quite a grueling um, process. Um, so when we got that quantitative data, that was subsequently supplemented by, um, uh, by complemented by qualitative work. And the qualitative work involves some semi-structured in-depth interviews with food vendors. We did a, a total of four, um, 45 um, food vendors and we try to represent the spectrum of food vendors ranging from you know mobile vendors to vendors who were sedentary to vendors who you know who were working in different locations across the city um, so in addition to that um, we also use some discursive analysis um, by looking at media reports now this is perhaps the the most recent aspect of the research, um, and this is this is just this this was essentially this essentially emerged out of a recognition that you know that those discourses were potentially valuable for us in understanding the picture of marginalization and you know pathways for planning and sustainability. So that this map really shows the distribution of vendors in the city. Um, distribution, the, base, the locations that were the main locations that we visited. And you can see that you have a range of um, locations, the bus terminals, permanent stars market. And I just decided to color code, color code it by location, but that's, that's just to give you an idea of the generalized distribution. Now, getting into some of the challenges faced by these vendors, uh, which is the first thing that we, we're, we're going to focus, the first theme that we're going to focus on. What challenges did they, did they face? And bear in mind again that this is the results are based on um, the administration of a survey that was that that was standardized um, and across and the same survey was administered across um, different um, geographic um, localities. So, as in uh, international, the same survey was administered in all the countries in which this um, report was, in which this study was done. So of course there are going to be um, categories and issues that certainly, you know, would not be, um, would not center, would not be, would not be important for our, for our vendors. Um, nevertheless, you know, whatever categories were represent, um, whatever the data is suggesting I'm, I'm representing here. So something like prejudice, prejudice against my nationality, would not be was so certainly not an important factor, um, you know, and accounted for probably just one percent of vendors there. Um, now you might be surprised, but we did find vendors who were not from Jamaica. Um, in the sample, you had yet we had about four vendors who were from Haiti. So and 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 that was actually quite surprising. Um, the main challenges <laughs> came up no surprise. Um, if you talk to any vendor on the street, they will probably articulate these things. I'll tell you, you know, insufficient sales, insufficient customers, the, the fees charged by suppliers, um, cost of goods and stuff like that. The, um, the, 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 the fact that customers don't pay, the, pay their debts, about 65% of the vendors articulated that as a main problem. Um, too many competitors, um, verbal insults, conflict, um, crime, and all of these things were articulated as, um, as challenges. But we also had some infrastructural challenges as well, challenges related to storage of, of, um, of goods. Um, and that was also something that, you know, could be, con that could or should be considered. Now, so th that's what was articulated on the um, vendors, on the vendors survey. Now, Other sentiments were evident in the interviews that were done, as well as through media discourses. And many of those sentiments aligned with what we found in the, um, in the, in the questionnaire survey. And there were some additional sentiments that were not necessarily captured by the questionnaire survey. One of the things that stood out to me um, was 
uh, this resonating theme of the impositions of urban development. And it caused me to question, is urban development a cure or a curse? And how, well, as it relates to, to the perspective of the vendors, are the vendors really seeing urban development as a cure or a curse? Urban development, for the most part, has meant more congestion and traffic and all of these issues. You might be saying, okay, what the hell does this have to do with vendors? Um, those problems with traffic are exacerbated by an inefficient public transportation system uh, where your decision to participate in public transportation is really a matter of constraint rather than choice. Um, anybody in Kingston who can afford to buy a vehicle will buy a vehicle to get around, right? So public transportation is you know, one of those symptoms of uh, the, the challenges associated with our public transportation landscape is one of those symptoms of urban blight that has become very, very problematic. And, you know, people complain about it a lot. You know, there's a lot of traffic and all of these things as well. So even if you have your private vehicles, time it takes to get from point A to point B is a lot. So we have addressed that by embarking on things like you know, engaging in broad widening projects and different infrastructural development to facilitate uh, enhancement of public infrastructure, different ways to facilitate, you know, to facilitate this, you know, growing population to facilitate, to reduce congestion. Now, um, a lot of these um, development projects um, are, we, we could be, it could be seen as positive, you know, if you think about it, you know, it injects, you know, we're getting we're getting loans to to expand our and our enhance our road infrastructure, and as the road infrastructure is enhanced, what that will mean is that, of course, our communicative capacity and competence is gonna is gonna increase. Um, you know, net, you know, networks will be facilitated, trade, you know, trading the movement of goods from one place to another. All of that will be enhanced, and all of that sounds all positive, right? And as such, um, we have you know, gone to the Chinese government for the most part, um, not um, for, you know, to facilitate a lot of these projects. And so a lot, of, a lot of the money will come from China, both in the form of public Chinese capital and private. Um, so you'll, you'll notice a lot of the developments that are taking place in Kingston now are the, the Chinese have got the contract to do these developments as well. Um, and what's, what's an increasing trend now is that private developers are now using, are now employing or engaging private Chinese companies to, you know, as contractors in, the, in their development. Um, so all of that is taking place and we're seeing all of these capital flows and some of the more significant ones in recent times has been represented on Kansan Spring Road where we had the improvement project um, that was, um, you know, where that was funded, I think that was valued at about 19 million, we got a lot of $19 million, the um, 90 million US dollars, the Mandela Highway Reconstruction Project valued at 64 million US dollars, and the Hagley Park Road Improvement Project at about $56 million. Now you might be thinking, okay, who the hell cares about all of this? This is all good, it's development and, you know, the roads are improving, um, but here's the problem. The problem is that a lot of this infrastructural expansion has actually compromised um, the informal sector to a large extent by displacing many vendors. Um, and my focus is specifically on informal food vendors for the research. However, um, a lot of these practices, a lot of these impositions extend to other areas, extend to other types of vendors. Um, and then, so I've, I've, so what I've shown, what I'm showing on this slide is really an image of at the top right hand corner, you're seeing the Kansan Spring Market. And this was before 2000, this was taken in 2018, early 2018, right? Um, before the market was destroyed. Uh, this was a main place in, in this, in this um, outlying business district of Manor Park in the Manor Park or Upper Canton Spring area. This was a um, this was a you know main trading ground for a lot of the vendors, a lot of food vendors. Um, now uh, the picture at the bottom right hand corner is just still just showing you it 
you know, like the, the, the building has now been demolished and this was taken in 2019. On the left-hand side here, what you're seeing is changes that have been made to the Barbican roundabout area. And that has also contributed a lot to displacement. Um, whenever we have these infrastructural changes, we have, we have a lot of displacement of the informal sector groups who are particularly vulnerable because of their precarious position in the economic structure. Um, they're not registered, many of them. Um, so, you know, so it, especially when they don't have, when it comes to space, they don't necessarily own the spaces that they, 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 they occupy. And so when it comes to negotiations, they are really at the, you know, they're really holding the blade, essentially. They're at, at, the, at the losing end of negotiations and they're not necessarily adequately empowered. Um, so what this has actually, um, my bad, I don't know why I've had economic, um, but so it has potentially exacerbated um, existing inequality and intensified economic and social exclusion. Um, well, um, so that's that's one of the negative consequences associated with these challenges, and the discourses of exclusion are also uh, represented in some of the ways that you know some of the responses by the state as it relates to to this group. Um, so, um, what we found when when you when you look at a lot of um, newspaper reports, for example. Um, and I've indicated these and, 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 and I've just did a kind of cut out of some of those reports. Um, vendors were generally given very short notice prior to removal. And this is specifically, and specifically in the case of the Kansas Spring vendors, they were given very short notice. Um, when we interviewed some of the vendors in Kansas Spring, what they, what they were saying was that they had, they heard about it. Um, but there was nothing, there was no letter, there was nothing formally communicated. There were rumors of it. Um, and so, you know, they didn't know that they were gonna be moved and that they were gonna be moved until, you know, it was, you know, they, until it was very close to the, to the removal date. Um, they didn't feel that they were adequately included in discussions about relocation. And um, when those, and, after those discussions were concluded and after the decisions were made, some vendors were actually reassigned to spaces in other markets. I would think that, well, this is a good compromise. Um, you're, you have a space in the market here. Um, let's move you to Coronation Market or let's move you to you know, a market on Spanish Town Road, whatever it is. So many of them are assigned spaces in other markets, but there's a problem there. Um, they articulated concerns over increased transportation costs. And they also suggested that this relocation to another market actually disrupts their social and business networks. Um, it compromises their customer base and their suppliers. And many of them also suggested that, you know, it has its own dynamic. It has, every market has its own dynamic. You know, you're now in, in a space where you have to now get to know everybody in that space. The space is competitive and many of them you know, said that if they had to move to that location, they would not, they would not necessarily, um, they would, if they had to move, they, they would not vend in that location because they also articulated a great deal of risk, um, a great deal of threat, um, fear of crime and other things. So one representative of the vendor said, if it, if it is that you were looking to put a series of shops or whatever here, why can't they be considered? Why can't they be brought into the conversation so that they know. And, and that was you know, the, the kind of general sentiment they felt excluded from the conversation. And on the right hand of the screen, you're seeing uh, some vendors in the case in the KSMC, um, you know, holding up a legal document, um, you know, just just protesting the the, the, the protesting this decision to relocate. As I said, they were eventually relocated. Now that one is somewhat of a, that's a, quite a concrete example of the way in which state policies actually contribute to this marginalization. But we have um, 
things that have not yet, have not quite materialized, but we can position these policies as threats and public health policies are, could be considered one of these threats. Um, so I titled this slide, you know, school vendors, school gate vendors as casualties and the, of the war and sugar. And you may have, you may recall that in 2018, there were a lot of talks about banning sugary drinks. Um, the first place or the focal point, the initial focal point for that ban was actually in schools. And a lot of the interim policy guidelines suggested that those um, suggested that the, you know, school, schools had to adhere to, or schools would have been required to adhere to these um, impositions by 2000, January 1, 2019. And um, it gave, you know, it gave, it gave relatively little time to adjust when they, when they announced it. It was approved um, by cabinet on December 3rd. Um, and that, so, and it wasn't just, it wasn't just the school canteens, but the, the vendors themselves are in, so the, 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 the guide, the, the, the draft policy actually indicated vendors, it indicated um, food retail in and around the, 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 the around the school compound. So that would inadvertently include vendors, right? Now, this was against, you know, the background that there was also, you know, no, there, there, there weren't a lot of alternatives. Um, one of the things that vendors benefit a lot from is actually the sale of these sugary drinks. Now, I'm not here to, to debate whether or not, um, you know, they're right or the policy is right or wrong. I personally agree with the policy, but I'm just articulating the extent to which this policy presents a potential threat to this already marginalized group. Um, and when you look at the, the media constructions of this threat, vendors were often discursively constructed as a source of threat, both in the media, in public discourse, as well as in, in, in you know, when, when, when you look at, when you look at the, the policy, the, the, when you look at the, the move by the government to actually target vet school vendors as well as school canteens initially. Um, the problem though, is that there was differential enforcement and vendors, you know, were targeted, schools were targeted, but of course, you know, the primary distributors of these goods were, would actually be um, larger retail entities and Whereas the government was moving in that direction, it's certainly the initial the initial impositions seem to be seem to have been unfavorably skewed towards the, the skewed against the um, vendors, and some of the vendors actually complained that there was little um, sensitization or intervention. They didn't know anything about about this ban on sugary substances. Now, what is interesting is that. This has actually been halted, so it is not it is it is not currently enforced. Um, however, it remains as a looming threat. Another aspect of um, public health policies that potentially compromises vendors is the the structure and organization and and the whole dynamics of securing food handlers permits. Food handlers permits are required for vendors, but they the food handlers permits. It, it, this, that kind of system shows limited sensitivity to educational and literacy levels. Um, when we look at our sample, many other vendors um, had really low levels of um, education. Um, no, we did not directly measure literacy, but in other contexts, what we have found, what, what, what other countries found was that literacy, not, not for this study, but in other studies that were other work that we have referenced, literacy levels tend to be low within this group. And so this, the way in which, you know, so, so these requirements are inherently, are intrinsically in exclusive. Um, the, the, they're also generally given in many instances, limited time to, to, to register. Although 
you know, they're also they're always told you need to register to be a vendor, but when there's limited, there's often limited registration time, limited time windows given prior to the clearance. Um, and also permits require frequent renewal and that can also pose a challenge. Now another issue centers on the challenges associated with municipal maintenance and regulation. Now I would add that the largest contributor to the KSM, KS, Kingston and St. Andrew Metropolitan Corporation, the largest contributor to the budget of the KSMC is actually the, um, is actually the fees that they collect from markets and, 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 and not just markets, but even the vendors that you'll see in halfway tree, these people are all charged. Now, despite that significant revenue injection, um, it, it obviously costs quite a bit to run these up to run these facilities. But nevertheless, these facilities are poorly run, and the, the poor facilities are a perennial concern for many of the vendors. Many of the challenges relate to security. Um, they articulated issues related to sanitation. Um, they also um, articulate a lot of issues related to the zonation or allocation of spaces within and just outside the market. Um, and there's, there's a general sentiment that, um, that they were neglected. Uh, that is, and so some of these discourses, these media discourses, endorse some of those findings that were articulated in the interview. The picture on the right on the bottom right hand screen shows the coronation as um, an image of the coronation market just showing you um, what you know an example of some of the um, the, the, the of, of an example of the condition of some of the facilities there. Now so that's so vendors are extensively challenged. It is a highly competitive space. It is, um, you know, it is, they're, they're, they're experiencing quite a bit of um, impositions that are rooted in, you know, the state policy or lack thereof, or, or, and lack of, or and inadequate interventions um, to a large extent by the state. Um, but they have, Pushed back, and they have tried to respond to these challenges in different ways. And some of the ways that they have responded to these challenges, based on the results of the survey, include things like um, offering credit to customers, extending up, uh, um, hours of operation, and purchasing stock in bulk, and, and of course negotiating with suppliers. Those are the most commonly um, utilized mechanisms of resistance in, 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 in essence. But there are other uh, are, are commonly utilized mechanisms of navigating these operational challenges. What beyond the operational challenges um, and the modes of navigating them, there are other modes of resistance. And these modes of resistance could be considered as legal, spatial, or social. Now, a good example of a legal uh, mode of resistance was the fact that the vendors in the constant spring market, they actually rallied, lobbied, um, went to court um, and they got, but you know, it was, it. <laughs> they were granted a 14 day injunction, which is essentially an extension. It represented an extension on the time that they were given to move. Um, many of them it, it did not see this as a, as a win. Um, they, they thought that, you know, it was, it was inadequate time and the, you know, nevertheless, it, it this could, you know, the fact that they actually utilize the law, utilize legal pathways could be positioned as a potential way or a potential mode of empowerment, um, despite the outcomes here. Um, but vendors also tried um, to empower themselves in spatial ways. So one of the examples of that were and you, you would have seen it all across Kingston, it's when they form these informal clusters. Um, and these informal clusters are 
considered, you know, are you know probably spaces of about five, five vendors or more, five, 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 five or more vendors in one in one area. And these are informal spaces; they're not formal markets or formal vending spaces. But it's just you know they're just clusters of vendors, and we see this when we're coming in from like out by the boulevard, for example, by the Haney Park, that area, um, and all over the city centrally. And actually just outside many of the formal markets, you do have these clusters. These clusters can be considered a form of spatial revolt in the face of state impositions. Now, another way that they have resisted, um, that they have navigated these impositions um, has to do, to do with the so and with the fact that they engage their social capital so they have utilized their networks um and 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 even the even you know this legal lobby was a representation of harnessing the power of that network um another way that they harnessed their um, that they relied on the intrinsic um value that is embedded in networks is through the, the ways in which they access capital. We found that many of them access capital through by, access capital by going to friends and family instead of seeking um, formal for instead of seeking formal um for formal sources of capital like um, going to banks and other places. So what we have concluded essentially is that you know, quite a few gaps exist. And some of these gaps present pathways for policy consideration. You know, one of those gaps has to do with the fact that we do need a lot of data. We do need a lot more data. Um, we need greater levels of disaggregation of the data so that we can, so that policies and pro, so that programs can be more nuanced um, to address the specific circumstances of vendors and particular and some groups of, of vendors like youth vendors. Um, as it relates to age, um, we found that vendors were generally within the older age groups and they typically averaged over 40 years. Um, and just a little bit over 20% of our sample was actually youth vendors. But a glaring gap in national youth policy is actually the absence of specific attention to youth in the informal sector, a group which is um, extensively comprised of youth engaging in, in informal food retail livelihoods. So specific attention should be placed to the critical needs, experiences, and constraints of um, facing youth vendors. And what we also know from the more recent statistics, and if you even look at it in a historical sense, when we look at our unemployment levels, youth unemployment is uh, always exceeds um, general unemployment levels. And youth unemployment has actually been exacerbated by the impositions of things like COVID-19. Um, also, gender presents a, a really important policy consideration given the extent to which um, this attribute may, might actually compound existing vulnerabilities among marginalized groups. So in our study, women represented the majority of food vendors, but actually re reported lower profits, albeit marginally lower, but it was still lower. Um, this may even have implications which link back to things like household food security as female headed households are very common in the family structure. The most common, uh, one of the, more, the most common family structure among that socioeconomic bracket um, within the urban poor. And therefore greater focus should actually be on gender mainstreaming within all, within all policies and programmatic interventions for this group. Um, we also, Need to consider the role of the potential role of ICT interventions and, and improving things like technical literacy amongst this group. We've seen in places like Kenya, for example, that operational efficiency has been enhanced by these types of in interventions. And then finally, we have to understand 
more and more, we have to tap into these networks. Existing networks can be used as potential raw material. These informal networks are really good raw material for engagement, really good raw material for more structured, in, for, for interventions involving um, more, you know, more structured efforts. So we really need to get more data where that is concerned. And I'm going to end it here. I realize I have, I just have five minutes to the hour. So I'm gonna end it there. And I thank you for that. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, on behalf of all the persons who were listening in to your presentation, I'm sure like others, I learned a lot about vendors and the, the characterization of the persons that comprise vendors, um, some of the factors that they operate in, such as the rate of urbanization, urban blight, um, some things about your research framework, um, political economy. And of course, um, I really appreciated the examples you gave, very visual examples, such as those around Ponson Spring Market. And of course, everybody's um, sort of childhood memory of, for some people, of the vendors at the school gate and their trays of goods. Um, and of course, like the good geographer that we managed to put um, everything into neat headings of legal, spatial, and social. Um, at this point, I am going to open and ask that if there's anybody who wants to make a comment or to ask a question, that you raise your hand and I will acknowledge you for the question or comment. Any questions or comments from the audience? Go ahead, Dr. Blissett. You can unmute and pose your comment or question. Just um, I want to thank um, Robert for that. Um, decisive um, incisive talk and and it's really enlightening to see but um doc how do we go forward with respect to the inequality and all of this that is that that that, that, that we see but that the local or international what is the what is the methodology for going forward in in, in solving some of this 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 problem Thanks, thanks, Blissy. That, that's, uh, that's such a very good question. How to go forward? And we will, we, we, sh we will progress for, I don't have a lot of optimism where that is concerned. Um, I know that we will progress for, uh, we will go forward um, in a really awkward way, perhaps. But here's, a, here's, here's, here's my take on it. Now, to go forward, we need to not only focus on supply, the supply side of things. The supply side is where we focus on the vendors, um, where we focus on, you know, and for much of what I have spoken about in the, in the presentation today, focuses on, you know, like the economics of the vendors, the social dimensions, and, you know, so they're the ones that are supplying or distributing the food. We also need to place more emphasis on the demand side of stuff doing um putting in place policies that will strengthen the market base of these vendors putting in place policies the broader policies enforcing broader policies putting in place pro um, programs i should say i don't think we necessarily short of policies in that regard but certainly in terms of programs and meaningful interventions um that um as it relates to changing one inequality two poverty levels in the city right um, so I think when we address those things, I think that the, you know, it, it, many of the challenges associated 
with what we're seeing here will also be addressed. Um, so I think the way forward, um, yeah, is would re will really be defined by taking policy more seriously, um, putting in place necessary programs, and uh, yeah, and and of course some capital injection wouldn't hurt as well, or will be necessary, I should say. Yes, Donovan. Uh, yeah. So 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 this this would this this would mean that 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 from a that, that it, it would have to come from a governmental level or, or, or this would have to be from, from when I say government, I mean, uh, not federal. We don't have a federal right. government. Um, so central it would, central it would, government or it, local government. Is that local government? Well, it would, it would need to come from both central and local government. Um, because of course, local government is more intimately and intricately connected with the day-to-day -day management of, of many of these spaces. Uh, local government can also make demands as it relates to, you know, the, uh, the need for allocation of, um, you know, finance, of capital to, to, you know, to facilitate the management of these spaces. But I think beyond the state, beyond government, um, it will also take, you know, injections from our interventions from you know the private sector public private partnerships will be important and also even from the academic community in terms of building the repository of knowledge that exists um on on, on these um on this on this community um so yeah i think even 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 yeah so i think i think it will it will require a kind of a comprehensive approach, not necessarily just from the state. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Yeah, mine. Um, you can go ahead now. Right. Thanks, Robert, for a very interesting presentation. I really like the, the, the project. Um, I have just one question. Um, the, the divide between the formal and the informal in some of these spaces, you know, is sometimes artificial because right. you know a lot of formal establishments would, you know, have people operating informally that they give their products to to distribute. I, I'm wondering if you came across any interesting configuration um, of that type of relationship. That's one, and then two. Um, where next would you want to take this type of work? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that question, Donovan. All right. So the info, you know, the, the, the whole notion of that divide between the informal and the formal was a big challenge for us at the start of the project. Um, for one, do we consider persons who are paying their market fees, there are these municipalities that operate in the space, do we consider them informal? You know? Um, so that's so th because some of them are actually registered vendors, but does that constitute formality? Uh, many of them might not, but the, the reality is that a lot of registered vendors are not necessarily, you know, file, they're, they're outside of the, the tax net. And that was one of the, you know, that was kind of used to, to kind of filter, to, in an inf in a kind of indirect way, filter individuals. Now, yes, you do have establishments that operate as formal entities, but they have strong connections to the informal sector by employing, you know, they, they, so they're formal, informal in a sense. So they're employing individuals in there. I didn't necessarily come across um, those establishments. Um, but I have no doubt that they would they, they, they would they would probably be a part of the landscape. Perhaps what limited that was the for for, for this research was the scale of the enterprises that are focused on. So these weren't very large enterprises. Um, I think that might have might have affected, but in, in terms of looking at in terms of coming across that type of configuration, um, not not I don't it, it wasn't detected in this research. Not that it didn't exist, but we just didn't detect it. Um, the where where do we go from here as it relates to this research? So there is a lot of work to be done, particularly as it relates to looking at additional experiences as it relates to these vendors. So what came out of this was, you know, 
the fact that vendors are challenged in many, in many ways. And these challenges translate to implications for their households. And you know, so that type of that type of research, um, going going back to looking at, okay, this is the role that they play in food security. Um, this is a role that they play in the urban food system, but what are their unique and specific conditions like? So that again, we can, you know, with that information, we'll be able to I think we, we lost to there for a bit, Robert, but I understood what you were saying. So thank you very much for your response. Yes, we seem to have a little audio problem with Robert and his connection. Um, it would be nice if he was around to get his thank yous, but it seems as if um, Possible not here, not hearing us, not able to speak with his audio. Yes, he's dropped out totally now. Yeah, um, yeah, reconnecting. Yeah. Let's see if he reconnects. That looks like an internet disconnection issue on his end. I don't see him coming back in. Um, it's a bit of an anticlimactic note to end on after such a rich presentation um, that we've had this afternoon from, um, oh, here he is. Here's Robert. Sorry about that. My uh, my light went out for for a few seconds. It has come back, but I noticed that the internet is not back yet. So I am um I'm connecting over my phone. Well, Robert, we were just acknowledging that it would have been very anticlimactic for you not to be present for um, the vote of thanks that I wanted to offer to you for, I threw out a challenge in the department group about testing the pitch after rolling back the covers um, for the brown bags. And I'm sure that everyone will agree that we are off to a wonderful start and um, if all the presentations are of this standard and generate the kind of interest that we've managed to generate today, we will have a good year of brown bag seminars. Robert, thank you so much for sharing your research with us. It is truly appreciated. Um, I hope that there were some students who were able to um, listen in and get stimulated by the potential for research you not only showed results, but of course you showed the scope for where there are still information gaps or extensions to the work. Um, let me offer my best wishes for you as you deepen the work um, and, and extend it. And of course, for being our first presenter in the Brown Bag Seminar Series. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, everybody. And of course, to thank the persons who attended, because of course, it's not nice to speak to an empty room. And we appreciated all the persons who made the time to be with us this afternoon. We meet again for another brown bag next week. And we look forward to your participation with us. Same time. And we will, I'm not gonna swear it's the same Zoom link, but certainly we will share the information. Our next presenter will be Professor Simon Mitchell. So we're hopping over the departmental divide to have a presentation from a geologist. So look out for the, the flyer and most of all, just save the, save
save the time on a Thursday afternoon to join with us for the brown bags. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks, Robert. Thanks, Tara. It was good. Donovan. Oh. All right. Bye, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everybody.